currently from Melbourne, Florida, Scott Busher and his family and their leadership would create an amazing home building empire inspired and named after the family matriarch Mercedes Holmes. He's earned his BS in business and economics from Edinburgh University in Erie, Pennsylvania. After college, Scott followed his father's footsteps and had several jobs in the home building industry. Here he would learn hands-on the various disciplines along the way that would make him a future success and help him earn his many achievements in the industry. Over his long tenure in the industry, Scott has had several notable accomplishments. He was the winner of the National Quality Awards in 1996 and 2008. Scott was also awarded with the best company to work for. He was featured on ABC's Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Scott worked on several projects involving the industry with the University of Florida developing a storm intervention home and zero energy home. He also designed and developed homes with solid concrete walls that were marketed as stronger, safer, and more energy efficient than other homes on the market. Currently, Scott is the COO of Mercedes Premier Homes and Vintage Estate Homes, which continues the tradition of a family business 100% privately owned. Scott and his family are currently living in Melbourne, Florida. VE Homes operates in multiple Florida markets, including Jacksonville, Orlando, and Melbourne, and in Texas markets as San Antonio and Austin. On this Wednesday's episode of Industry Elites, we are really excited as Vicky and I get the opportunity to chat with COO of Mercedes Premier Homes and Vintage Estate Homes, Scott Busher. Thanks for coming on our podcast today, Scott. Oh, thanks for having me. How's quarantine treating you? How's social distancing up in Florida? It's pretty good. We have never had to totally shut down. Our business has been allowed to function through the whole time. We allowed all of our people to work from home if they chose to. And believe it or not, most of our people wanted to come into the office just to have something to do because nothing else was open. There was nothing else to do (laughs) but work in that time. We did have a problem, a little bit of a problem. Our salespeople chose not to work. And we agreed with them because we had people coming into our model homes from all over the place, New York City, different countries, and they were very concerned about the virus, and we were as well. So for the month of April, we were totally closed down in our sales centers. However, construction and our offices, everybody came to work. That's good to hear. So for the most part, then you said Florida wasn't really shutting down, but did you have any sort of restrictions? Like have those small restrictions lightened up then? Well, home building and construction itself was considered an essential business. So we were allowed to work. All the other businesses, restaurants and theaters and many, many other businesses were closed down during that time. Now, at the beginning of, or I guess the middle to the end of May, we opened at 25% and now we're in a stage of opening at 50% for all restaurants and all other businesses. Florida is coming back online pretty steadily. Have you been getting any kind of delays with building materials or any other kind of shipments coming in? Because I know here in Canada, there's a backlog on pretty much everything now. We have, but not too bad. We have had some areas like our tile for showers or tile flooring. Some of that has been back ordered. Our customers have had to make other selections. Some of our appliances and light fixtures that the customers had chose were back ordered. So they had to come in and make other selections. But we have been able to accommodate the customer with other choices finish the homes and move on from there. But it has been a little bit of a struggle, but nothing that we have not been able to overcome. Aside from work, and obviously you said it's been running essentially pretty smoothly in comparison to a lot of other businesses and industries, but outside of work, then how have you been keeping yourself busy with you and your family? Well, (laughs) that was a little little bit of a problem because there was not very much to do when you left work. But what I wound up doing is I wound up golfing. I took up golf and I have golfed a lot more. Luckily, the golf courses were open and we had to ride one person per golf cart and we could golf every day of the week. So that was nice. The weather was perfect in that time of the year. So I wound up golfing a lot and wound up exercising at home more and learning to cook and grill out from home way more than I ever did. It's part of what we all had to deal with. 
Our golf courses just opened maybe a couple weeks ago. And I was kind of wondering with Florida, there's obviously a lot of marinas and a lot of kind of boat traffic. Here in Canada, our marinas were completely shut down. Unless you had a private dock, you could not enter the water. So I was just kind of curious, did you guys have the same thing over there or was that still all systems go as normal? No, in Florida, they did shut down many of the boat ramps. But if you had a boat in your backyard, you could go boating. And a lot of people did. Those were really probably the two main things you could do. You could go boating or you could golf. (laughs) Our beaches were shut down for quite some time. They didn't want anyone on the beaches. They were afraid of not being following the social distancing guidelines. But yeah, boating was definitely allowed if you had one in your backyard. I definitely think you guys have maybe had it a bit easier than we've had over here in Canada. They went from like everything being open to essentially an almost full shutdown. But I think it's given us all that time to reevaluate and try and uh, make the best use of our time even outside of those work hours. So just getting into a little bit more of a background in terms of yourself and your company as it is a family run business. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that background story for our listeners. Well, we started the business in 2012 after we had to shut down our business that we had for 30 years. But it's, you know, a family business and we operate in several different cities. Right now we're in Melbourne, Florida, Orlando, Florida, and Palm Coast, Florida, and just working our way out of Jacksonville, Florida. Also operate in Austin, Texas, and New Braunfels, which is right outside of San Antonio. What's nice about our family business, everybody has their own little area of expertise. My sisters, I have two sisters in the business, they really focus on designing the house, making sure our merchandising in the house is good, the marketing and the sales, and everything associated with sales. My brother, Keith, he is really in charge of our accounting, our money and our banking, and I am operations where I kind of pull everything together, oversee all of the purchasing, the construction, the service, purchasing of land, development of land. And so we all have our areas of expertise and we stay in and it works pretty good. Although, as you could probably imagine, like most families, we do have our little bit of butting heads, but we've worked together so long, we have learned how to work through those issues and get along because we've worked together for, gosh, probably 35 years now. So... Is there any tips you would want to give those kind of starting out in a new business and working with their family? I think the best thing starting out is to make sure you have a good operating agreement that says, here's how we're going to operate. And a good, you really need a good board or or a mediator because those issues are going to come up and you need somebody to say, hey, here's the middle road. You've got to give a little, you've got to get a little. And here's the best way to resolve it. And even with your operating agreement, it basically lays out, you know, hey, if you're equal ownership, here's how you resolve issues if you don't agree. So it's really taking the time up front at the very beginning before you start business, working through all the details you can think of. And it's probably good to get an attorney to help you say, hey, I've worked with a lot of other family businesses. Here's things we need to take care of up front and address and put in writing. So when something arises, we can resolve it very easily and cordially between the two parties. That definitely seems like the best way to essentially be organized right from the start. So if anything were to happen, you already have that plan in place. So I think a lot of people can take those tips and and run with them. I think they would be a great asset to helping them function. So within the world of building custom homes, obviously there's various different businesses out there. So maybe you can say specifically as to what makes yours stand out from the rest. The homes we build are, you heard me say earlier, my sisters are very involved in the design and the floor plans and the merchandising. And we believe that the women in most families are the ones that are making the decision more so that they're making the detailed decisions on the home. And our homes, they put an awful lot of thought into the floor plans, the traffic flow, the livability of it, 
how the kitchens function, how the master bath functions, how easy it's to get from the garage to get your groceries in, all the basic things that maybe a lot of other builders don't think about. Mm -hmm. The other thing we do is we try to get an awful lot of light into the house because even a smaller home will feel bigger with more light coming in. The other thing that we do is we have in-house decorators that do all of the merchandising for our homes. And when you walk in our homes, they feel very, very good. And again, my sisters oversee that and work with her very, very closely. So we get a lot of comments that people will love our houses and the merchandising. They want to know who did our decorating or where we buy this furniture or where we buy that furniture because they would like to get some of the same. And what I think helps us set apart in that area, I don't know if anyone has gone out and shopped for a new home recently, but in an area like Florida, you can shop 10, maybe 15 builders in a day. And when you get when you get home at the end of the day, they all start to run together. It's like, oh, my God, what did we see in that house? Which house did we see this bathroom we liked? Which house did we like that kitchen sink? And you can't it kind of all blends together. And we feel that ours kind of stands apart. We have our brochure packages, our decorating and our floor plans, we believe really help sell our house and set memory points in with the potential buyers. Could you maybe for our listeners kind of walk us through the process of what it would be to come to you to get a custom home? Well, we do custom homes, very large custom homes in in Texas. But in Florida, we build both starter homes and semi-custom homes Mm -hmm. that are, are larger and we allow them to customize. But the process they can find us on the web they can find us in various ads and or at our model homes and we also have a very good relationship with realtors in every city we operate in so we bring the customer in in various ways and then they come through our models and if they like what we have and the price point fits their needs we then go to contract after we go to contract we bring them in and they do a design center appointment to pick all their colors and selections and cabinets and flooring and all those items and then we go in for our building permits and we start the construction process from there we also wind up you know meeting the customer the very first day we start construction on an empty lot and we meet them several times through the process as we're building the home allow them to make electrical changes And then, of course, we meet them several times at the end to make sure the house is just the way they want it before they move in. What would the turnaround time look like on that? I was just kind of thinking about that. I don't even have Mm -hmm. a restimated time in my head. (laughs) I would think that'd be like years. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But it's quicker than that. (laughs) Yeah. No, it doesn't take years. But usually once they sign the contract, within the first 30 days, we have their selections done. We have their blueprints drawn to fit what they have chosen exactly in their house. And we have submitted, we have to get our plans engineered. So when I say plans are done, that's engineered and all of the other things we have to get to submit for a building permit at each one of the cities or counties. And that's usually kind of the longer process. We have waited up to a month to two months for the cities to get us back the necessary permit so we can start construction. And once we start construction, on our Florida homes, we build them in about 100 to 125 days. Oh, wow. And our Texas homes, they're much bigger and more complicated. They're closer to a three to a five month build time from the day we start. Then that shows you, I'm sure, the difference when you said that's more so the starter home in comparison to those custom homes where a lot more details and I'm sure a lot more interactions are happening to build their dream home, essentially. So the next question I would have as a follow-up to that is that you've built, I'm sure, numerous and numerous amounts of homes over the years. Is there a standout story you have about a house that you built? How does it feel even building someone that dream home? You know, we try to treat everybody the same. So to say there's one specific customer or one specific incidence that really sticks out, we don't. We, we really try to 
make sure that our communities we develop and the communities that we build in, you know, have symmetry that work together and, you know, make sure that every house gets done 100 percent complete for every customer and that they're happy when they move in. And one of our big things that we do at the closing table, if they're not happy, we really don't want to close them. Let's hold off and make sure if there's an issue, we can get it taken care of before you move into your new home. So we really try hard to get every one of the customers' the homes done just the way they want it. I mean, you were kind of mentioning there how to kind of make sure all the clients' homes are exactly what they're wanted. Is there any like common questions people are asking you or you're asking them prior to starting the build? We're asking them about, you know, we're getting information about their financing and what they want as far as livability in the home. And then we can direct them towards the appropriate size home and the appropriate house for things that we feel they want once they give us that information. So in terms of looking at people's finances, obviously everybody has a very different budget when when they're coming to you or coming to you that stage where they're wanting to have a, their own home built. So is there different packages in a sense? If you fall within this price range, this is what we're able to offer and moving forward up to higher price ranges or is it very interconnected? No, there's various neighborhoods that have different price points and usually the customer knows, you know, their affordability and where they want to focus. Sometimes we have someone come into our higher end homes because they're beautiful and they want it. And if they just can't afford it at this stage in their life, we usually have one or two levels down that we can guide them to and still get them very close to what they're looking for in the home for their affordability at this time in their life. You know, we have everything from townhouses to some starter homes to mid-level homes up to high-end homes that any one of our buyers can get into in most cities, except Texas. We just focus on the high end, the upper end. That's fair. So earlier you kind of mentioned that I guess there's a lot of other kind of builders in the Florida area, and I guess you could say a lot of competition. Would you say that referrals are really important in your line of business then? Oh, yes. Referrals, that's the voice of the customer, and that's the best sale you can get. It's the easiest sale because, you know, once you have a happy customer, they definitely have friends over to their home and relatives and we certainly hope they're going to talk good about us and that's the best best sales tool we can have so every closing we have a customer survey we ask them to fill out and it has about a simple one it's about six questions it asks how they rated their salesperson how they rated their builder superintendent how they rated our design center was their home 100 percent complete of all items at the walkthrough and then would you recommend mercedes homes or vintage estate homes and give us comments and i would say today since we've been in business we're probably running at about a 98 percent yes they would recommend us with good positive comments and that definitely helps the sales process and makes sales easier for our sales personnel Yeah, I think it's good to obviously know that in your industry and what you're doing, that you're getting that positive feedback and then that's transferring over to to new business. So I don't think anybody could beat that type of traditional referrals. In terms of looking at the market that the housing industry is within, you obviously have several different areas where you focus on building. So maybe you could touch on a bit how the market has changed over the last few years. Like, is there more influx of properties, more influx of people looking for homes? What's the climate looking like? Believe it or not, what we do today is we don't build very many two-story homes. Everybody seems to want a single story, one floor, and that's changed from 10 years ago. We all were building probably the opposite, more two-story homes at that time. So that's a trend that has been pretty interesting to us. And we thought we see it's not just the empty nesters or the older clientele, it's the young as well with little kids. They all want more on the first floor in Florida and in Texas. So that's one trend that changed. The other thing we're seeing is they have gone away from a formal living room You know, back traditionally, there was a formal living room, dining room, family room, kitchen, and nook. And today, it's more of an open floor plan where the kitchen and the great room 
and then a dining room are pretty much all one big area and we have a lot more light coming in and it, it just feels bigger and more livable. And it makes sense because most people never use a living room. What do you need it for? You know, mm -hmm. I guess back in the many years ago, it was for the formal setting, but that just doesn't happen in the world today in a, in a normal family setting. So the floor plans have changed and really have become friendlier to open spaces. And if you think about it, that's where everybody is in a house. They're either in the kitchen or in the great room watching TV. So if you make in one big area, everybody's together and it just seems to work better in today's market kind of mentioned how some of these like bungalow versus two-story trends are going have you found any kind of standalone trends in housing development or i guess kind of in interior design for 2020 so far no not really we do see a trend with all the builders are going to is to smaller lot sizes, meaning a narrower product. You know, we've gone to a lot of 50 foot wide lots with 40 foot product on it. And now the trend is to go to even smaller, you know, 40 foot lots with product that's 30 foot wide. And with that, I'm starting to see a new trend of the two story coming back. So that is something new that we're just starting to see in our markets, you know, over the last couple months. And I think we're going to see that just because the price of land gets so expensive and so expensive to develop. That's one of the things that we really have to do is to get them into an affordable home at that lower end is we're going to go to a smaller lot size. And I believe we'll be going back to two story homes. So that's interesting that you're able to see what was previously maybe trending beforehand and coming back a little bit full circle. So in terms of people building their own homes or even people who are looking to renovate their home that might be a little bit older on the side of design, where would you recommend they start and which area do you believe the home holds the most value? With a new build where you'd want to put the most money into because you'd see the most return for even those couples who already have a home who are renovating where they're like, okay, well, where do we start? Where is going to be the place where we can dive the most into it to see the most back in a sense? That's going to be in the kitchen. You know, in the kitchen and the master baths is where people are going to focus to put a lot of their extra money. And if they remodel, it's going to be in those areas. The kitchen today is really, you know, with the open floor plan, everybody wants a very nice kitchen with very nice features. Because if you have guests and family over, that's a big part of really your merchandising of your personal home is your kitchen laid out very nicely. So that would be the area that most people focus on. And when they come into our design centers, that is the biggest thing that they start with, the kitchen, the master baths, and then of course the different flooring types. But how do you find the balance between being a CEO and maintaining good family relationships outside of work and still kind of finding that time to enjoy your life? It's it's easier because my kids are all older now. They all have their own homes. Some are married. Some have boyfriends, so they have their own lives. So it's just easy. When I get home, I can go golf. I can go to the gym. I can go cook out. I can do whatever I want. So it's easy. And what we're doing tonight, my kids are all coming over for dinner and we do get together, things like that. But, you know, we just plan it out from because the, of their busy schedule and my busy schedule, but we make it work. The one thing that people were saying when COVID-19 hit was that everyone didn't realize how fast paced a lot of our lives were. Everyone was just constantly on the go, moving on to one thing to the next thing and not really having that time to stop. So a lot of the feedback I think I've heard from many people is that from this period of time, it gave a lot of individuals that period to focus on, oh, okay, well, I have a lot more time now. This is interesting. I haven't had this sort of break before. That is the truth watching tv and we started watching more of netflix and amazon prime movies and different things so yes those services definitely if anybody has stocks in those before covid hit i think they're probably doing not too bad at this point <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to actually touch on a experience and an accomplishment that you had previously with your team when you were featured on ABC's Extreme Home Makeover. So would you be able to tell
tell our listeners a little bit about that experience? That was really a tremendous experience for our whole entire company for many reasons. The way we would build houses, we built them in 90 to 120 days and the extreme home makeover, we literally had 90 hours to build it. If you take it, every hour was a day. And when you look at it in that standpoint, it was like, how are we gonna do that? But we really worked with the team from extreme home makeover and our construction team. We had a tremendous schedule. All the trades were staged a couple hours ahead of time, sitting in like a big air conditioned warehouse. And then they would come and our material would come and and it was really amazing. A couple things that happened during that build. At the very beginning, it started out very fun because it was an ABC affiliate and they owned Disney. So Disney had all kinds of character because we're the house we built was a half hour from Disney. So we had all the Disney characters there, the army men tearing down the old house that we had to tear down. They were acting like they were tearing it down with their ropes and pulling it over on the back side. <laughs> we, had, we had probably 20 concrete trucks escorted in with the police and the fire trucks and then Disney characters behind it. It was a lot, a lot of fun. But then when the work started and we had to create everything, back then our company and me, I personally started a process where we called, we did poured wall construction because mm-hmm. in Florida with our hurricanes, we build block, we don't build wood frame. So we developed a form where we could build a solid poured concrete home. And we did that for the extreme home makeover. But to get concrete to set up fast, because again, every hour was a day in the schedule we had to meet, we had to put an accelerator in the concrete to make it cure faster. And the way you make concrete cure faster, that accelerator creates heat and a lot of heat. As soon as we could strip the forms off of the concrete, it was just like it was steaming. It was just heat just coming off of it. And our framers started framing the house and then we set the roof trusses. And at about two in the morning, my wife and I were over there in a hotel sleeping and uh, we get a call and they said, hey, it's two in the morning and the carpenters are about three hours behind and they all walked off the job. They're just fatigued. They're just bent. They can't go. Oh my goodness. So I called my roofer at that time at two in the morning and I said we got a problem he said what's that I said my carpenters are just wiped out they can't go they're just fatigued he goes what do you need to do I said we need to put the roof decking on he goes I'll have 50 guys there in a half hour we get out of bed we go there this is still at two in the morning at this yeah. point when you guys were leaving I, so oh my goodness in the morning they're showing up by three o'clock in the morning I have 50 guys setting plywood on the roof nailing it down going like madmen and now the sun's starting to come up. It's probably 5.30 or so in the morning. And the sun's coming up and behind the house, again, that concrete is still hot. And that's why a lot of my framers were fatigued because the heat it was throwing off was immense. So this big thing of steam is coming off the roof of our house in the sun. And I look up there and I'm like, oh my God. I just, it just hit me. Our roof trusses are designed for a live load and a dead load. The live load is how many people or how much anything live, whether it's wind or a person, is on the roof. And I'm like, I don't know if our trusses are designed for that many people on the roof, which it worked out fine. You just had a lot of worries that would come up. I thought, oh my God, we got through and got caught up from being three hours behind. But now I'm worried, oh my God, I hope the roof wouldn't collapse, which it did not. But it was fun. We just had a lot, a lot of issues we ran into to along the way, which every builder did. But Disney made it so much fun. All through the build, we had every character there you could imagine, whether it was Goofy or Minnie or Mickey. And and then we had food constantly around the clock. And we had coffee around the clock. We had tents. We had entertainment. It was, it was a lot, a lot of fun. And when you got through the bottom of it, to the end of it, we built a beautiful home, had it decorated with the cast decorators, which 
which they were a lot of fun to work with. And we turned the house over and her name was Sadie Holmes. It was just a great experience. And the bottom line is it really showed all of my guys in construction that we could build a house a lot quicker than they were ever used to as long as there was a lot of upfront planning and a lot of time and effort into doing the scheduling properly and communicating with the uh, trades and the suppliers properly. So through that process, we had a lot of fun doing it and preparing for it, but it helped my company and all of my employees realize, hey, we can build houses quicker and we can get this product finished better for my customer in the end. So it was a great, great process to go through. It sounds like an incredible, incredible experience. It was. It was just great. It helped our business. It really did. Mm -hmm. It helped it in a lot of ways. We got a lot of good publicity out of it, but it helped my team realize that they could really build a house a lot quicker. And it got everybody into looking out for the little guy a little bit more than they ever probably did in the past. It's a great, great, great project we did. Yeah, for sure. It definitely sounds like a great experience to go through and definitely once in a lifetime kind of opportunity. We are kind of nearing the end here of our episode. Is there anything that you'd want to tell our listeners before we sign off? I guess want to say as our home building business is a lot of fun. It's a lot of hard work, but it's very rewarding in the end. One thing about our business, a lot of businesses, you know, you just come to work and you either shuffle papers or you talk to people. In our business, we start with a raw piece of property and we develop it into a beautiful neighborhood with a nice entryway with landscaping. And then we build a family, a home that they're going to raise their their kids in and bring their friends and families over. We get to see things progress. We get to see things start with nothing and then build to a beautiful finished product. And that's a very rewarding thing to be able to do in the community. Oh, I love that. I think that's a great way to end our episode. So Scott, thank you so much for joining us on today's episode of Industry Elites. All right. Well, thank you for having me.